to welcome all of you to this afternoon's spring workshop. We had a wonderful writing workshop this morning with Shu Shi, our primary uh, sort of guest of honor for, for the day today. Um, and we're delighted to continue our conversation around narratives uh, and narrative inquiry and research in Hong Kong. I said in the morning, and I just want to repeat it for those of you who are here, every year we, you know, this is one of the things that the Women's Studies Research Center colleagues is really look forward to because it's an opportunity to share with you all the conversations uh, and sort of the directions in which we're moving uh, and to give you a little peek into some of the work that's happening here at ACU and to look at how that connects to other conversations in the circles and communities that you're a part of. So thank you so much for being here with us today. But I think we ask Casey to come up and hold the words before we pick up. Thanks so much. Ruja, who is our ever energetic leader. I don't know how she does what she does. Um, it is terrific. We have participants from a range of sectors. As Ruja said, this is a chance for us not only to share with you what we're doing, but to hear what is happening in the community after our community stakeholders. This year, our numbers are slightly smaller because many of, many of you will know the unconference is going on today and tomorrow. And so we are aware that in the NGO gender equity space, this is a very full weekend. And we're delighted that um, Tula has presented this morning. She's here with us now. Some of you may be in and out. But welcome. Um, time clashes are unavoidable right here. This particular day was conceptualized several months ago up in the senior common room. And several of us were having lunch. But it goes well beyond that. And so we're thinking the theme of Stories Matter brings us together today, but we're thinking about the power of narrative and the power of narrators. We assume if you are in the room today, you are either a storyteller, you are thinking about how your story might be told or has been told, or you're interested in stories or narrative research in some way. As Pooja mentioned, we began this morning with Shushi's writing workshop. And she reminded us of several key principles. First of all, we need to think about the why of what we write. And she was kind enough to help us orient some of her work that she does with authors at large or creative writers, to help us think a little bit about academic writing as well. We decided that it's very hard to be a good academic writer and a good creative writer, but we need to do a better job of bridging those sorts of gaps. But one thing that she said, she said many things that were reassuring, but one thing in particular is that the only way to figure out how to be a better writer is to continue to do it. And so I think for all of us who are here today, we're thinking about narrative as enlightenment and empowerment and activism. And so probably if you're here in the room already, you're committed to this sort of work in some way. And so we want to think about how we bring various types of narrative making and narrative analysis together. Storytelling, of course, is very old. Narratives of people and civilizations have been handed down for literally thousands of years. And these written texts that we have today are oftentimes built on oral texts. So we have, um, I think, living in Hong Kong and in Asia, we are close. We live very near to all the civilization sites where we can think about the power of narrative in geographical spaces and physical spaces as well as other sorts of spaces. But today we're thinking about more recent views of storytelling as well. And very recently, as recently as this week, there's been discussion in the news about how individuals, nations, institutions decide to tell stories. So we argue about stories. We litigate about stories. We go to the movies or switch on our devices to interact and see stories. There are stories of the China dream, Brexit, Brexit, culture wars, Black Lives Matter, alternative facts, right? These are all stories about narratives. And more recently, Pooja and I were chatting this morning about 13 Reasons Why, the miniseries about suicide, um, young girls and suicide in the US. I've been, um, several of my students wanted to talk about the Heineken Open Your World campaign. And was that a better way of telling a story about getting along in this moment than the Pepsi World's Apart campaign? <laughs> so that was um, a reality check. And I've, Jamie Peck in The Guardian reminds us that vague progressivism should not hide the fact that brands are not your friend. And so I think we want us to think about the ways in which the language that we treasure gets used a particular way. And this is something Eugenia Marquet reminds us of. 
constantly in her critique of some of the, the neoliberal feminisms that we see in our narrative making. So today and in the years to come, we invite you to join us on our Women's Studies Research Center journey to engage in what Pujika Pai calls challenging and complex conversations about narratives and narrative inquiry as a developing field. But we also want to cast the net very broadly to bring in work that you are doing or that you're interested in seeing us to do. So all types of narrative research, narrative inquiry, narrative making are under our umbrella. And it's not even a new idea for us. I chatted a bit with e <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> pardon me. Yiwan Ng, who is not with us today, she's at the Unconference. And she reminded us that in 2008, we gathered under the title, Research Matters, the Production of Knowledge in Hong Kong. And so I wanted to share just a few words that she wanted you to hear today. And she said, nearly a decade ago, we foregrounded narrative research because, quote, we were self-consciously concerned about the feminist and gender production of knowledge in Hong Kong. Narrative research then was a promising paradigm because it drew in qualitative research and feminist preoccupations about the creation of meaning within a specific context, the power relations between researchers and participants, and a vision of research that enables social justice. The speakers included academic staff from the educational field, women with physical disabilities, and a counselor working with rape survivors. The theme also basically picked up the fledgling effort by local academics to uncover the oral histories of marginalized grassroots women published in Chinese and rarely translated, unfortunately, into English. So she recalls particularly May Partridge's challenge to help us think about women's studies in Hong Kong, how it had come to that day, and then to move us forward. And so she even reminds us that narrative inquiry, the sort of the founding text, by Clandon and Economy suggested that, she said, feminist researchers should engage with this framing of narrative inquiry. Honestly, I feel like narrative inquiry should engage with feminist research and analysis, because that's been going on a whole lot longer, but that, you know, whatever, right? Um, the fact is there's overlap, and we welcome that overlap. But Eva reminds us that we need to, to continue to do that job of seeking opportunities to work with all sorts of populations, all sorts of women and men, people with a range of sexual, racial, and ethnic identities, and the good news is that's exactly what's happening today, if you look at the program. Eva also suggests, that, and we talked about this, that as WSRC folks, we can do a better job of working with you and engaging in peer review or helping you to move along in your work and we'll talk a little bit about late, a little bit later about some of what we hope comes out of this day moving forward. So today we showcase work that has been done by some of our core group members who are oftentimes familiar faces of these events, but we also have new members who are involved as well. I want to remind us that we stand on the shoulders of early work done by Elizabeth Sin, Patricia Chu. Wailing Wong in both the Hong Kong Oral History Archive as well as the more recent Hong Kong Memory Project as well as all, of, all sorts of other people that I'm not mentioning here. But that also Hong Kong has been an important site of narrative inquiry framing and a relatively recent book, the 2015 Routledge publication, Using Narrative Inquiry for Educational Research in the Asia Pacific has a, a, a number of chapters that are specifically on Hong Kong or Macau. And so it was important for me to go back and look at that work. And although it dovetails specifically with higher education, edu educational sector, and psychology and counseling, there are some very quick insights that I want to flag here. First of all, narrative inquiry is a methodology, and we should not be apologizing for it. And all of the scholars in this book felt like they had to explain why they didn't have to apologize which says something, right? We're still struggling. That there is a whole ethics around narrative inquiry that we need to think about. What does it mean to fictionalize narratives? We need to do that sometimes to protect anonymity or to reach a broader audience, but what are the implications of that? Obviously, how do we understand ourselves in relation to the story? And many fields have engaged with that, as have women, gender, and sexuality studies. But thinking about the importance of context sensitivity. What do we know about Hong Kong context, an Asia context, and these are topics that we've taken up here at Hong Kong U before, whether we're thinking about Asia as method or Hong Kong as method, but we need to bring these conversations together as we think about narrative. 
how do we move from some of the earlier language about coming to voice frameworks or marginalized history frameworks to more intersectional stories and how do stories both empower but compete with each other in a world of limited attention and limited resources. And then ultimately something that Pooja will take up is the question of who speaks for whom and when should we not tell a story because of who we are as well as when should we feel free and empowered to tell any stories. So, um, a little bit closer to home, I just want to flag what's happened over the last year in terms of Women's Studies Research Center work. First of all, you'll see a lot of the panels today are WSRC affiliates, but the recent work that has been happening, um, we've been working in concert with Terry Yao and the senior management team on putting together video narratives dealing with um, sexual harassment on campus, and that's in the process. We're looking at putting together a um, MOOC on gender, is it gender and women's studies? What's the title of the MOOC? We're working on a MOOC. It's coming. Um, but speaking of MOOC, Professor Gina Mark Jenny Marchetti and Aaron Manion Park and myself work with Morgan Wong and a team from Tele to put together Hong Kong Cinema in a Global World. And that was an, an opportunity to think about not just film as narrative, but story makers in Hong Kong film and the various people within the industry whose stories tell stories. We also have with us Valerie So, who is a filmmaker, doing narrative work, interviewing um, and making a film about the Taiwanese love boat participants. And really, <laughs> take it, raise your hand and take an opportunity to chat with her. We'd like to have her here today. Um, we think of you as part of WSRC, Valerie, even though you come and go, right? Um, Jason Cohn, who is not with us today, but teaches about arts and the politics of narrative. He analyzes narratives of cultural memory and his early work on competing narratives of subjectivity in film, particularly on Lee's film. And he reminds us that we all narrate ourselves into being. Andrew Hoang is Andrew here today. Andrew has been doing interesting work with LGBT young adults, reflections on secondary school in Hong Kong, and their letters of encouragement to other students who are feeling marginalized or bullied. We also have um, folks sort of on the the fringes of what we do at WSRC, but who are delighted to share their work with us today. Janet Borland, a colleague from the History um, Department originally, but also Japanese Studies lately, has done work on children's narratives of the Great Kanto Earthquake in Japan. Sylvia Mark will be a moderator today. We don't get to hear about her book, but please check it out. She's done wonderful work on ethnographies of Hong Kong and Hollywood films and filmmakers. So, there's lots going on. I've flagged just a little of it, and our panelists will tell us more. To our panelists, our first panelist today is Shushi, who really is the heart and soul of why we're doing what we're doing today. And you have a bit of a bio for her already, but I would just remind you that she has been doing this work in her own fiction, essays, um, I would say activism as well. I think she's a literary activist. I don't know how she sees herself. But she's somebody she's taught at multiple institutions in Hong Kong and in North America and elsewhere. She has a memoir that will be published on July 1st. But much of her work engages her own story or other stories as a historian. I find it incredibly enriching to read but also to teach. And I taught her novel, That Man in Our Lives, just recently in my gender history course, and it's delightful to see a new generation discover her work. Shushi manages to adapt to the changing times, much better than I do, and I envy her for that. So um, please do read the bio, but I don't want to take a whole lot more time. She will be our first speaker, and then I will introduce the other two so that you don't have to hear from me. We'll have a running narrative of panelists. Um, after Shushi, you will be delighted to hear from Marco Wan, who comes to us from the law faculty, and although a joint appointment in the English faculty as well. Uh, not a joint appointment, I'm an honorary. Thank you. So, and I first came to know Marco's work before I even knew Marco. Everybody was talking about Marco Wan and the wonderful work that he does. I heard him on the radio yesterday morning. So, like so many of our guests today, there are the many lives of Marco Wan, public scholar as well as academic. And after we hear from Marco, Petula Ho, Ho Sugin, many of you know, will be with us. And um, 
Fatula is going to get a little bit, all of our video presenters will have a little bit extra time today. So we're watching the clock. We may not have as much time for Q&A, and we're going to shorten your break a little bit. But she will take um, about 30 minutes and give us a bit of a walk back through the work that she's done over the years. So an embarrassment of riches, welcome, and... Essayer, 
which is to try to attempt. And it's sort of worrying an idea, it's sort of exploring it, investigating it. Um, language plays a big part. I mean, language plays a big part in all writing, but in creative nonfiction, I find um, you get to be a little bit of a poet. You get to play around with language more. Um, sometimes it's an incident. Quite often it's a particular incident that somehow doesn't leave you. It could be from a long time, it could be from your childhood, from wherever. It's the thing that you can't kind of forget about or let go of, and that's why you want to write about it. Um, personal history, memoir, of course, aspects of life that sort of still keep resurfacing the older you get and the older I get, the more I seem to remember about things that I've completely forgotten about, which is, I don't know, a good or bad thing, but anyway. And obviously, with nonfiction, especially if it's a factual subject or something that I, I want to learn something about, I want to research a lot. So what I thought I'd do today, I was going to talk about writing my last novel versus writing a memoir, but it's too short to, to cover that. So I just picked a theme that I've addressed in both fiction and nonfiction. It's the idea of the writer or artist in Hong Kong, thwarted by society and culture. Um, I think the betrayal I'm interested in, or was interested in, was the, the betrayal of ideals, artistic ideals. This is a very commercial town. So the lure of commerce is very real. Um, societal bias or uh, against the arts and more about more practical things. It's a very pragmatic society. So the two I chose to use is one that, um, the short story is a short story called The Art of Love, and it was in this book. Um, called um, Obedee Hong Kong. Um, I have book cards there, so if you want more information about either book, you can find that. And um, the other one, the nonfiction, was a personal essay, which was in this essay collection, um, Evans and Isles, and it's called A Two Mong Pair. So I'll just use these two and compare them, and compare the creative process of putting them together and how they emerge to give you a sense of the difference for me. when two former lovers meet again after a long passage of time. That's the setup of the story, okay? It was something that was, I was trying to write about, very interested in this idea, like what happens if you meet somebody, before? okay, in this case I use a former lover, but somebody you haven't seen in a long time, because who you were versus who you are, are two different people, but yet you're still the same person as is the other person. So I wanted that. So here's a summary of the story. Um, these two people, who were lovers, meet again 18 years later, and they've had no contact in between. Um, the protagonist is a man named Sunny Pasawa. He's a poet. And the woman is a maker named Victoria Chang. She's a painter, or was a painter. Um, they were colleagues at an ad agency, and that's how they met. Sunny was a third-rate copywriter, really wanting to be a poet. He was very serious about being a poet, uh, and always was. And he was, uh, and so this is a brief and idealistic um, and torrid affair that these two have, um, because uh, Victoria was between husbands. <laughs> she had sort of started divorcing one, and then she was sort of beginning to take up with another guy, and she ends up engaged to a new man, who was the create, senior creative director at the ad agency, who is Sonny's boss. That's how in her name. But then she has an affair with Sonny. So this was sort of infidelities and betrayal was in the story. And the story plays with time because it moves between the front and back story throughout to get the central truth for Sonny. So that's basically the setup of the story. So here was one of the real origins, which I used in the epigraph. It's um, a quote from one of the novels of Jose Saramago, the um, Nobel Prize winning novelist uh, from Portugal. And it's from a book called The Year of the Year of the Death of Ricardo Raiz. So it was the first book of Saramago's I ever read, and I was captivated. Right? What really struck me was this idea of that one moment of splendor. I think about that and make that a story. So this was a real entry point for the story. The, this particular story is in, in the section of the book of mine entitled Our Bodies Remember. So the sexual side of the affair 
is one of the primary of the entry points of the story. So, Sonny is Macanese. He's mixed Portuguese and Chinese, but he grew up in Hong Kong mostly. He now lives in the U.S. He's become a poet in the U.S. She is Hong Kong Chinese, kind of an Anglophile. She's married to this British guy. The story, the front story, opens in 1999, which is the year of the Cao handover. And Sonny, you know, he's won this big award in poetry in America. So he's come back to Hong Kong partly because of the Macau handover. And he's come back to Hong Kong U. That's why I chose this story, because this takes place in Hong Kong U. Um, and he's to give a reading and a lecture at Hong Kong U for his new book. Um, and, he, and he's just been honored by the Academy of American Poets. Now, Victoria is in the audience. And so of course she comes up to him afterwards. And he pretends not to see her at first. And the first feeling he has is that he's really annoyed when he sees her. Because even though it's 18 years later and she's now 57, a lot older, um, he's a lot younger. He's 15 years younger than her. And he's still now 42. He still finds her desirable, which is really, really irritating. <laughs> okay? So um, when they had their affair, he, she was 39 and he was 24. So there's also the power dynamic an older woman and a young man. Here's the front story. Sonny gives his read. The South China Morning Post covers it and writes a review. He made his reputation as a poet in America because he writes poetry in English. But um, in this new book he has, he has the English and also trans he's also a translator, so he translated it into Chinese, so it comes out in a bilingual edition. And his primary conflict in the story is that he can never go home again. His father is a very famous translator who teaches at Hong Kong University. And now he's retiring and he's being honored and everything else. Um, and even though his poetry volume is, you know, has Chinese translations and everything else, the journalist who covers it sort of damns him with faint praise. So this is what happens the next morning after this really he reads South China Morning Post and he's just curious. So here's the front and back story. So Victoria meets him after the um, talk and they exchange phone numbers. Of course he doesn't call her, but she calls him two days later. And she speaks to him in Chinese because of course they both can speak Cantonese. And um, he's, she, he says, you know, why didn't you ever stay in touch with me? And um, he suddenly realized, oh my god, maybe this he had actually written her a letter years ago. And apparently the letter had never arrived, thanks to his own kind of bad behavior. He was mad and he had a brief fling with the secretary of Victoria, and then never calls her again. So when she gets the letter that's addressed to Victoria, and she sees it from Sunny, she probably never gave it to Victoria. 18 years, and now he finds out. So that's one betrayal. So here we have the back in front stories. So the first part is in the Pass. The betrayal here that I'm talking about is for Sonny becoming an English language poet was so important. At 24, he had just gotten his first book. Um, he got a big fellowship to go to America to study. Um, and, and he was, you know, he was so excited about his book. But Victoria who he had been so much in love with because she was also an artist, a painter, and he felt like, oh, we had a real connection. It's kind of like bored with him because she's already, you know, ready to go off with this other guy. And um, his father, of course, thinks he should have been writing in Chinese. And so he, he says this to Victoria, and she says, well, it is your mother, Tom. You should be writing in Chinese. And he says to her, it too. Now this is of course the most famous scene of betrayal in Shakespeare uh, from Julius Caesar. At that moment when um, Caesar is assassinated and he turns to Brutus, it too, you too, Brutus. So 
so that was something I pulled out of it. But in the front story, he is shocked to discover that she doesn't paint anymore. That she, all she was was this dilettante who was just, you know, having an affair with him. And he is humiliated. So that was kind of the process of the story. So now I'll talk about the nonfiction, which is a different kind. And of course now, it do is um, again a signal from Shakespeare. Mon Père is my father. And uh, the summary here is very simple. I was a science student at the home three. I was screamed below originally into the arts. Uh, my mother insisted I moved over. And you know you really can't do that once you've been screamed. But of course, my mother is a very forceful woman, so she went to my headmistress and said, "Please, please, please, let my daughter into arts, into science." And so finally, the headmistress, I think she just wanted to get rid of my mother, said, "Okay, if she takes, if she gets tutored this summer and she comes back in the fall and she's able to prove that she can pass the exams or whatever, we'll consider letting her." So I spent the whole summer taking private tutoring on physics, chemistry, and all the rest of it. And back in September, I was I went into the arts class. I was there for a month, and then my headmistress let me move over. The reason that I really didn't want to take science was because I couldn't study literature for two years. My school, the curriculum that we did, if you were a science student, we didn't have literature. We had history instead. And I was already a writer, so this was, a, this was like terrible to me. But you know, my mom got away. But the betrayal that became the subject of the story was not about my father, but about my mother, but about my father. And it surrounds one specific incident in this moment of my going to Oxford Science. So this is how it opens. With the nonfiction essay, I basically wrote it chronologically. I just told you from the beginning to the end what happened. Sometimes that's just the easiest thing to do. With that short story, I did the front and back story, but this one I just, just tell it. Okay, I'm 14, emotions run really high. My English teacher, Mrs. Liao, my favorite teacher, she was pretty disappointed that I went and moved over to science, and I really felt like I let her down. And that was kind of one of the trails. I write about that in the essay, but I won't talk about that today, but it's in the essay. The more important trail I was feeling in my personal history, the conflict of the decisions you make in life that you later regret. I don't regret a lot of decisions I made. I really feel like I should be responsible for the decisions I made. But I, I really did regret this one. So I really felt it was important to explore the nonfiction. This is one of those things that just wouldn't be. It was so significant in my adolescent life. But you know what the problem was not really my mother. My mother always thought I should be a subject in sciences. She wanted me to be a doctor. She wanted to be a doctor. She was a pharmacist. My mother was a sports person, you know. She doesn't read. I mean, not really. I mean, she reads the newspaper or whatever, but she doesn't read books. She doesn't read literature. My father, on the other hand, was proud of my uh, writing. He was a singer and a violinist. He read voraciously history, politics. He didn't read, you know, fiction that much, but he, he understood the importance. He was a verbal person like me, you know? And so I kept thinking, maybe he'll let me stay in arts. So here's the incident. This is the night before I actually moved from the science arts class into the science class. So I went to my father. It was in the evening which is usually, and my mother probably had gone to bed already, um, because that's when I usually go and talk to him. And I kept saying, I thought, maybe my father will say, no, 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 it's okay. You're right, you should just go and stay in arts. And I thought, I have one more day to try to do this. So you can read this part, and I'll just read you the tiny bit after this time the pause was significantly longer. I could hear the excuses, the circular logic of his debating style, his roundabout prevarications when he didn't want to commit to a viewpoint, the refuge of parental solidarity when we, the children, were beyond the limit. 
In the silence of eternal moments, I heard all that he could have said, to which he knew I would cross mouths talk to him with him. Instead, at the end of silence, he looked me in the eye and said, yes, this is what I believe. Not me, but I. I stared at my father. He had told me the one lie that was unforgivable. In the moment, though, you do not analyze or reflect or argue, in the moment, you only feel the force of betrayal, its fatal wound, and surrender completely because there is no other choice. You know, part of writing nonfiction too, the process I think, is to confront painful truths. My father was my hero, you know. He was, I'm really my father's daughter, not my mother's. Um, but you know, my mother's very straightforward. It's like, hey, you will do science because it makes more sense, right? So, <laughs> um, but you know, it was kind of cathartic to write this too. But so here's the end to the process. In fiction, you, you get your kind of truth. You know, this moment of splendor happens in the past, that night on the beach where they had this great sex. And she says, we are both artists. Yes, in that moment she was. But never again, that was her one moment of splendor. And it's kind of ironic because, of course, um, for, for Sunny, it's like a, an understanding that she was not a real artist. It becomes, the story is about a resolution that Sunny must deal, deal with. Because he held on to this image too of her. It's his own failing too at the end of the day. But nonfiction, on the other hand, is about life. And life goes on, despite those deeply felt emotions, you know? And I guess really understanding what really happened as well as the consequences of my actions probably the really more important thing that the essay allowed me to. So that's what happens in the greater process for me at least in, in these two pieces. Thank you very much. taken from a recent book um, about, from my recent book on broadly law, literature, and gender in the 19th century in England and France. Um, and more specifically, the book is about um, literary trials, so fiction that sparked real life court cases. Um, so very often they were obscenity trials, but not necessarily. Um, and the title of the book is masculinity and the trials of modern fiction. And what I want to do today is to draw out some of the themes of the book in an attempt to spark some discussion about gender, um, especially about the intersections of cultural constructions of femininity and masculinity. So one of my starting points is that much of feminist inquiry frames men and masculinity not so much as the enemy, that's a bit crude, and a bit, uh, too strong. But as a kind of monolithic problem, right? so if you look at the work of somebody like um, Janet Halley, the Harvard Law Scholar, um, she says, you know, Halley says, feminism can be kind of distilled into a three-part formula, right? So, first of all, M is not equal to F. Men and women are different. Second of all, M is bigger than so in a patriarchal system, women are always relegated to a subordinate position. And third of all, feminists have to carry a brief for it. They have to speak up for it, have to say, speak up against this uh, kind of oppressive system. So masculinity is conceived of as this kind of powerful, ideological, institutional force that has to be kind of fought against. Um, and what I found interesting about the 19th century um, is that it was a period in which masculinity was very much in crisis. It was not so much powerful, but kind of besieged and fragile. Um, the dominant model of masculinity of this time was one that was rooted in procreation, in fatherhood, in family, the kind of paterfamilias. And as the century wore on, this model became increasingly destabilized because of changes in women's status. 
right? So if you look at legislative changes at the time, you know, divorce became a limited, but real possibility possibility for women. The Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 made divorce easier, cheaper, and then you have this whole series of acts in the second end, second half of the century that expanded the grounds of divorce for women. Um, legislative changes in the second half of the century also made um, made it easier for married women to retain greater control of their property. Um, and then at the same time, you have improving educational opportunities for women. So the first um, all-girls school in England was established in London in 1850. Um, and then from that point on, you know, increasing educational opportunities, women in higher education. Um, and with all of that came, of course, increasing work opportunities for women, more women in the workforce which led to this anxious kind of destabilization of the boundary between the public and the private. Right? So the public realm, traditionally the masculine realm, the realm of work, the private realm, traditionally the realm of the family, the realm of femininity, and all of that became, the distinction between those two realms became increasingly blurred. Um, and all of this was complicated by the context of empire. So on the one hand, you had this conception of bourgeois masculinity that was tied to, again, this idea of the family. Like having a family, providing for the family, being for the, there for the family. Um, and then on the other hand, you had this kind of imperialist ethos, uh, which dictated that masculinity was characterized by precisely leaving the family, right? having the spirit of adventure, um, of exploration, um, going to far off lands to, you know, in service of the country, far off lands like here, I suppose. Um, so, a real man at the time was at once someone who placed his family first, and someone who was expected to set sail to the furthest corners of the earth. Um, and all of these kind of factors made masculinity, again, you know, fragile, problematic, contradictory, um, and to use Annalise, Annalise Mons colorful phrasing, you know, they made every man consider whether he could live up to the grandiose ambitions that his sex condemns him to conceive for himself. So all this formed the backdrop to the study of law and literature in the book. Um, and looking at the literary trials of this period, uh, what I found fascinating was that almost all of the literary works that got into trouble with the law at this time troubled masculinity in some way. Um, and so I begin the study with the Madame Bovary trial in France in 1857. Madame Bovary, as you probably know, a novel about a woman who is bored with her husband, bored with her provincial life. She has two affairs um, and then ends up committing suicide. Um, and in the trial, the, adult, the adultery depicted in the novel was ostensibly the reason for the legal prosecution. Um, and the, the prosecutor kept describing Emma Bovary, the protagonist, as a, a lascivious woman. You know, and, and Flaubert was, was painting this lascivious tableau. Um, but you know, I think a, a deeper reason for the trial was that Emma Bovary was regarded as somehow too masculine. Her behavior was was too masculine, it troubled masculinity, and it didn't conform to the notions of femininity, proper femininity of the time, right? So, you know, she had sexual desire, right? She initiated affairs, right, with women were not supposed to be. It's the domain of the man. Um, she takes on a younger lover, right? And, you know, there is that, that power dynamic, you know, between an older woman, someone who was more experienced, and the, and the younger man. Um, and the poet, Charles Baudelaire, called Emma Bovary a bizarre androgen, so, so bizarre androgyno. And I find that phrase fascinating, right? That she was, she was an androgen, she wasn't quite a woman, right? she was too masculine. And this mix of femininity and masculinity was bizarre, right? It was, it was inconceivable, it was too weird for that period. And then I end my study with the World of Loneliness Trials of 1928, so looking into the 20th century. Um, the Well of Loneliness, the first mainstream novel about lesbianism, um, and there was this kind of uproar when it was published. Um, and you know, going to the archives, digging, digging through some of the parliamentary records of the time, 
what I found fascinating and amusing was that the parliamentary records about whether lesbianism, lesbian behavior ought to be criminalized <coughs> included all these anecdotes by members of parliament about how lesbians would steal married women away from their husbands. <laughs> right? So there were all these women who were, you know, like taken away, ran away with these, with these lesbians, leaving their husbands bewildered and ruined. Um, and you know, this was very much a conception of lesbianism as you know competition, right? The lesbian competed with men. Uh, for respectable wives, and you know, that was that fed into the anxieties about masculinity of the time. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the work on gender that I've been doing that I wanted to share with you. Um, and I'm conscious of the time, but so you know, and I promise to keep this presentation short. So I'll just end with a couple of um, takeaway points, I suppose. Um, the first point I'll make is you know I think there needs to be more of a dialogue between women's studies and what's kind of loosely called men's studies. Right? In so far as femininity and masculinity are intertwined concepts, um, changes in one leads to changes in the other, and they react to changes in the other. And so if we only focus on what's happening in one domain, one form of cultural construction, you know, I think there is something that's missing that we need to take into consideration. Uh, second point, stories do matter. Um, fiction can constitute, I found, the presentation of gender categories, you know, whether it's the androgen, uh, the lesbian, um, gender categories that interrogate, that challenge, that even subvert gendered order. Um, and I think that's one reason why the law has always taken literature very seriously, that there is this awareness that fiction does contribute to the formation of societal norms, um, including gendered norms, norms that the law itself is trying to perpetuate, um, that, may, that the law itself may be based on itself, um, but which don't necessarily conform to the norms that literature is putting forward. Um, and then finally, the law itself is a form of narrative. Right? So for example, if rape law defines the offense as um, something that could only be committed by men against women, and not vice versa. Right? If rape law defines the offense as something that only a man can do to a woman and not vice versa, then that's already telling a story about femininity and masculinity. Um, and I think that, um, that that is something that we need to be vigilant about. So I'll end my comments there. work because I want to show you films. Uh, first, I want to uh, show you my earlier film, which is uh, called um, Sea Line Trilogy. So I have love, sex, and hope. Which one do you want to see? <laughs> because we don't have much time, you want to see love, sex, or hope? Anyone? Hope. 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 <laughs> ah, interesting. Hope. Oh, okay, I'll remember this. Anyone? Why? Why hope? Because this is such a hopeless time. Yeah. <laughs> we need change. Because every time when I ask people, they always say sex. <laughs> okay, I will keep this in mind. So I will show you a bit of sex and see if I have <laughs> Anyway, you surprise me. <laughs> Stacy, what am I going to do? Anyway, so. I will show, show sex and hope. And hope. Okay, now for those, uh, like Stacy and my students over there, for those who have seen my earlier films, I urge you to uh, go through a journey of reflection with me and see whether it makes sense to characterize my earlier films as domestic narrative or personal narrative. Or my question is, Susie, is there a better word to characterize such kind of narrative? There are moments of splendor, there are betrayal, but what should I, how should I characterize that? Because after that, I will show you my recent films, which I will characterize as political narrative. And um, the reason why I have done it this way is because recently I have read uh, Molly Andrews' book called Narrative Imagination and Everyday Life, 
2014 excellent book, and the other one is Shaping History, Narratives of Political Change, and there is also a chapter in how social movement matters. So I will first, let's see this film and see what you think about them as domestic narrative, and then we will compare it with my recent film. Uh, sex, maybe. <laughs> I promise you will like it. <laughs> you will find hope in it, especially the first story.